Hey everyone, how are, how's everybody doing again? Um, yeah, sometimes I live here and I uh, wanted to um, come back on live and tell you about Hamilton's argument for safeguarding against domestic factions and insurrections. Um, and this argument is in Federalist paper number nine. And um, so Hamilton uh, and Madison are very, uh, are, are the founders who argued strongly for a central government um, in America. And they were very involved in what liberty means and uh, how they wanted the new government to look like. So he starts off by saying, to the people of the state of New York, a firm union will be of the utmost moment to the peace and liberty of the states. As barrier against domestic faction and insurrection, it is impossible to read the history of the petty republics of Greece and Italy without feeling sensation of horror and disgust at the distractions with which they were continually agitated and at the rapid succession of revolutions by which they were kept in a state of perpetual vibration between the extremes of tyranny and anarchy. If they exhibit occasional calms, these only serve as short-lived contrast to the furious storms that are to succeed. If now and then intervals of felicity open to view, we behold them with a mixture of regret arising from the reflection that the pleasing scenes before us are soon to be overwhelmed by the temptatious waves of sedition, sedition and party rage. If momentary rays of glory break forth from the gloom while they drivel, davel us with a transient and fleeting brilliance, they are, they at the same time admonish us to lament that the vices of government should pervert the direction and tarnish the luster of those bright talents and exalted endowments for which the favored soils that produced them have been so justly celebrated. From the disorders that disfigure the annals of those republics, the advocates of despotism have drawn arguments not only against the forms of Republican government, but against the very principle of civil liberty. They have decried all the free governments as inconsistent with the order of society and have indulged themselves in malicious exultation over its friends and partisans. Happily for the mankind, Stupe stupendous fabrics reared on the basis of liberty, which have flourished for ages, have in a few glorious instances refuted their gloomy sophism, and I trust America will be the broad and solid foundation of other edifices not less magnificent, which will be equally permanent monuments of their errors. But it is not to be denied that the portrait they have sketched of Republican governments were two, two just copies of the original from which they were taken. If it had been found impracticable to the devised models 
of a more perfect structure, the enlightened friends to liberty would have been obliged to abandon the cause of that species of government as indefensible. The science of politics, however, like most other sciences, has received great improvement. The efficacy of various principles is now well understood, which were either not known at all or imperfectly known to the ancients. The regular distribution of power into distinct departments are branches of government. No, um, the introduction of legislative balance and checks, the institutions of court composed of judges holding their office during good behavior, the representation of the people in the legislature by deputies of their own election. These are wholly new discoveries or have made their principal progress towards perfection in modern times. They are means and powerful means by which the excellence of Republican governments may be retained and its imperfection lessened or avoided. To this catalog of circumstances that tend to the amelioration of popular gov systems of civil government, I shall venture, however novel, it may appear to some to add one more on a principle which has been made the foundation of a objection to the new constitution. I mean, the enlargement of the orbit within which such a systems, such systems are to revolve either in respect to the dimension of a single state or to the consolidation of several smaller states into one great confederacy. The latter is that which immediately concerns the object under consideration. It will, however, be of use to examine the principle in the application to the single state, which shall be attended to another place. The utility of the Confederacy, as well as to suppress factions and to guard the internal tranquility of states, as to increase their internal force and security, is in reality not a new idea. It has been practiced upon different countries and ages and has received the sanction of the most approved writers of the Founding Fathers' time, is what he's saying, on the subject of politics. The opponents of the plan proposed have, with great assiduity, cited and circulated the observations of Montesquieu on the necessity of a contracted territory for a Republican government. But they seem not to have been apprised of the sentiments of the great man expressed in another part of the work, nor to have adverted to the consequences of the principles to which they subscribe, which, with which ready acquiescence when Montesquieu re recommends a small extent for republics, the standard he had in view were of dimensions far short of the limits of almost every one of these states. Neither Virgin, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, New York, North Carolina, nor Georgia can by any means be compared with the models from which he reasoned and to which 
the terms of his description apply. If we therefore take his ideas on his point as the criterion of truth, we shall be driven to the alternative either of taking refuge at once in the arms of monarchy or of splitting ourselves into an infinity of little jealous clashing tumultuous commonwealth the wretched nurseries of unceasing discord and the miserable objects of universal pity or contempt some of the writers who have in that time come forward on the other side of the question seem to have been aware of the dilemma and have even been bold enough to hint at the division of the larger states as a desirable thing such as such an infatuated answer no an infatu such an infatuated policy with a desperate expedient might by multiplication of petty offices answer the views of men who possess not qualifications to extend their influence great beyond the narrow circles of personal intrigue but it could never promote the greatness uh, or happiness of the people of america referring the examination of the principle itself to another place as has been already mentioned it will be sufficient to remark here in the sense of the author who has been emphatically quoted upon the occasion it would only dictate a reduction of the size of the more considerable members of the union but would not militate against their being all comprehend in one confederate government and this is the true question in the discussion of which we are at present interested so he further says so far are the suggestions of montesquieu from standing in opposition to a general union of the states that he explicitly treats of a confederate republic as the expedient for extending the sphere of popular government and reconciling the advantages of monarchy with those republicanisms it is very probable says one that mankind would have been obliged at length to live constantly under the government of a single person had they not contrived a kind of constitution that has all the internal advantages of republican of a republican together with the external forces of a monarchical government i mean a confederate republic this form of government is a convention by which several smaller states agree to become one large one which they extend, intend to form it is a kind of assemblage of society that constitute a new one capable of increasing by means of new association till they arrive to such a degree of power to be able to provide for the security of the united body a republic of this kind able to withstand an external force may support itself without any internal cor cor corruption as we see today the form of this society prevents all manners of inconveniences if a single member should attempt to usurp the supreme authority 
he could not be supposed to have an equal authority and credit in all the Confederate states. So did you understand what he said? Were he to have too great of an influence over one, this would alarm the rest, as you see today. Were he to subdue parts that which would still remain free, might oppose him with force independent of those which he had usurped and overpowered him before he could be settled in, t in his usurpation, as we see today. I, I don't know if you see it, but we have sovereign states and we have states who are attempting to usurp the supreme authority and we have states who are pushing back against that influence and alarming the rest so should a popular insurrection happen as let's suppose January 6 <clears throat> in one of the confederate states the others are able to quail, quail it. Should abuses creep into one part, they are reformed by those that remain sound. The state may be destroyed on one side and not on the other side. The Confederacy may be dissolved and the Confederates preserve their sovereignty. As we see today, if these usurpations continue, the Confederacy that formed the Union of the United States can dissolve and still keep its sovereign states. So if our nation crumbles, each state is still sovereign to where they can just, the Union can be dissolved, but the states are intact. The Confederacy may be dissolved and the Confederates preserve their sovereignty. As this government is composed of small republic, so every state is a, is, forms a smaller republic. It enjoys the internal happiness of each with respect to its external situation. It is possessed by... by means of association of all the advantages of a large monarchy. I have thought it proper to quote at length these interesting passages because they contain a luminous abridgment of the principal argument in favor of the union and must eventually, effectually remove the false impression which a misapplication of other parts of the work was calculated to make. They have at the same time an intimate connection with the more immediate design of this paper, which is to illustrate the tendency of the union to repress domestic faction and insurrection. A distinction more subtle than accurate has been raised between the Confederacy and a consolidation of states. The essential characteristic of the first is said to be the restriction of its authority to the members of their collective capacity without reaching to the individuals of whom they were composed. It is contended that the National Council ought to have no concern with any object of internal administration. An exact equality of suffrage between members has also been insisted upon as a leading feature of a Confederate government. These positions are in the main uh, uh, arbitrary 
They are supported neither by principle nor pre precedent. It has indeed happened that governments of this kind have generally operated in the manner which the distinction taken notice of supposes to be inherent in their nature. But there have been in most of them extensive exceptions to the practice which serve to prove as far as example will go that there is no absolute rule on the subject and it will be clearly shown in the course of this investigation that has as far as the principles contend for contended for has pre prevailed it has been the cause of incurable disorder and imbecility in the go in the government the definition of a confederate republic seems simply to be an assemblage of societies or an association of two or more states into one state. The extent modification and ob objects of the federal authority are mere matters of discretion so long as the separate organizations of the members be not abolished so in perfect subordination to the general authority of the union it would still be the fact in fact and in theory an association of the states or a confederacy the proposed constitution so far from implying an abolition of the state government makes them constituent parts of the national sovereignty by allowing them a direct representation in the senate which today our senators are not directly representing our states and leaves in the possession certain exclusive and very important portions of sovereign power so amendment 17 if you read Hamilton's arguments, he is saying that the people have direct representation within each state and the states have direct representation in the national government in the Senate, U.S. Senate. But because today the people elect both House and Senate, that direct representation eliminates the states and leaves in their possession certain exclusive and very important portions of sovereign power. So Amendment 17 and Amendment 16 are both usurpations of the intent of the Founding Fathers. This fully corresponds in every rational import of the terms with the idea of a federal government. So we are neither a national nor a federal government in America. We are a mix between federal and national. In the Lycian Confederacy, and I don't know how to pronounce it, which consisted of 23 cities or republics, the largest were entitled to three votes in the common council. Those of the middle class to two and the smallest one to one, the common council had the appointment of all the ju judges and magistrates of the respective cities. This was certainly the most delicate species of interference in their internal administration. For if there be anything that seems exclusively appropriated to the local jurisdiction, it is the appointment of their own officers. Yet Montesquieu, speaking of this association, says, were I to give a model of the excellent of an excellent confederate republic, 
it would be that of Lycia. Thus we preserve, thus we perce perceive that the distinction insisted upon were not within the contemplation of this enlightened civilization, civilian, and we shall be led to conclude that they are the novel refinements of an erroneous theory. And there you have it. For a good parsing of this from an authority that's excellent, I would go to heritage.org slash political pro dash process slash backward slash slash report backward slash Alexander dash Hamilton. And I would search for progressivism, Alexander Hamilton and the American progressivism. They have a full report of what Hamilton was talking about in Federalist Paper number nine. Um, and, and really quickly, I will give you just the first intro to it. Was Alexander Hamilton one of the most consequential of the American founders? Actually, an early version of modern progressivism? One could entertain such a suspicion on the basis of some of today's political discourse. On the right, certain libertarians and limited government conservatives dismiss Hamilton as a prophet of big government. The odd man out in a founding generation that insists, I, I don't think he is modern day progressivism. If Hamilton was here today, I would have to say that Hamilton was effectively he wanted a from reading this he wanted a a central government that would protect the sovereign states but he wanted the states to continue being separate and independent and i haven't read the whole thing But Hamilton's legacy was for liberty. And he wanted a constitutional re representative government that will cure the evils of other republics and democracies. But at the same time, protect the Confederate States. But that's my interpretation of Hamilton. Um, and he wanted to secure the best government that will guard against corruption and the factions and insurrection of society. And like he said, if the, the central government were to usurp the powers of the states, the states can dissolve the Union and they would still be intact. But that's what I think. Until next time, comment below and let me know what you think of Federalist Paper number 9 on how to keep the Republic safe from tyranny and anarchy. Go read it. You can also go read uh, the actual paper online at founders.archives.gov The little arrow without the line. So it's like a little halfway triangle without the documents Hamilton so this and I'll put it down there
but it's it's from the National Archives. Um, you could find it on there, and you could read it yourself and ponder it, his thoughts on what they were creating. Thank you very much. And until next time, here's Martha with a constitutional lesson.